The Seven Churches of Revelation Following Jesus' death, Rome and the surrounding territories became increasingly hostile to his followers. Every disciple except one was martyred for his faith, according to tradition, and that disciple's fate was not much better. John was exiled to Patmos, a rocky, inhospitable island. During this time of exile, Jesus Christ appeared to John in a vision. He revealed far-off future events and gave John messages for each of Asia Minor's seven churches. The Lord's letters, peppered with words of encouragement and correction, offer a promise to him who overcomes. Even today, they identify the types of difficulties that Christians face and teach us how to overcome adversity. Introduction to the Seven Churches Ephesus, the Loveless Church Revelation chapter 2, verses 1-7 through seven. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The church of Ephesus had many admirable characteristics as well as one tragic flaw. Christ praised them for their good works, perseverance, and church discipline that protected them from false teaching. Verse 4 reveals where they went wrong. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Everything about the Ephesian church appeared to be in order on the outside, but their hearts were not in it. Faith without works is dead, James said. James chapter 2, verse 26. In this passage, Jesus warns that doing works without love is equally problematic. The devotion of the church to Christ was dwindling. The problem with Ephesus. Christ offered a three-part solution to the church's lack of love. Remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Consider how your relationship with Christ was when you were first saved. Consider what it was like to put your trust in Him for both the smallest and the most important of your needs. Repent. The next logical step is to repent after remembering where you started and realizing where you are now. Turn away from your current path and toward Christ. Repeat. Repeating the original good works will help you return to where you started. Do the first works. Return to the spiritual disciplines that kept you close to Christ and motivated you to follow Him when you first became a Christian. Christ warned the Ephesian church of the consequences if they did not follow this three-step formula. I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Verse 5. In other words, he would diminish the church's influence and power. There is a cost for turning away from the Lord. Smyrna, the suffering church. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, KJV. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy work and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Christians in developed countries today have little concern about being persecuted for their faith, but there are churches around the world where persecution is a daily occurrence. Such was the case with Smyrna's ancient church. They faced pressure, poverty, and persecution because they refused to worship pagan gods or Roman emperors. Verse 9. 
Smyrna was one of the two churches that received no rebuke from Christ. This congregation witnessed the ugliness of oppression while surrounded by one of the most beautiful cities of the ancient world. The words of Christ to that church can prepare all believers for what is to come. Be fearless. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Verse 10. We have nothing to fear because Christ is Lord over all of life's circumstances. Nothing, according to Paul, could separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, NIV. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Fear is a natural human response, but we live supernatural lives because of Christ's power in us. Be faithful. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Verse 10. Given the severity of the persecution in Smyrna, I believe Christ was saying, yes, you may lose your life for my sake, but be faithful until the end. Pergamos, the compromising church. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight amongst them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Because of its paganism and idolatry, Pergamos was dubbed Satan's city. Christ's mention of Satan's throne in verse 13 may have alluded to the city's Zeus altar. It was the most famous and ornate altar in the world, built on the Acropolis. Some historians believe that this altar was used during Antipas' martyrdom. In this cradle of pagan activity, professing faith in Jesus Christ had dire consequences. The church's very existence demonstrated conviction and courage, but idolatry had crept into its congregation. They had combined the gospel and paganism earning Christ's stern rebuke. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against the promoters of Balaam and the Nicolaitans with the sword of my mouth. This blending of beliefs has plagued God's people since the days of ancient Israel and continues to this day. Satan seeks to corrupt through compromise whatever he cannot curse and crush. Christians are not called to be combative or antagonistic, but there is a better way than Pergamus's choice. Maintain a distinct identity. Today's church has become so obsessed with staying relevant that it has become irrelevant. People around the world find little that is unique in local churches, so they remain uninterested. Some will oppose living out the gospel, but God will use it to save the rest. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8-10 through 10. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Speak the truth in love. We must be vigilant, sober, on guard, and speak the truth in love wherever corruption or compromise seeks a foothold. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, Christ. When we confront sin, we seek reconciliation rather than condemnation. There will come a time when Christ will judge every soul. We have a responsibility to lead people to the cross until that time comes. Paul called this the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Remember the lesson from Pergamos. Keep an eye out for the dilution of true doctrine. If that means we're intolerant in the eyes of some, so be it. Our preferences cannot be used to define truth. It exists independently of popular opinion and does not conform to popular demand. If we adhere to sound doctrine, Christ will commend us in the same way that he did Antipas, his faithful martyr. Thyatira, the Adulterous Church, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. To the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When it comes to spiritual and moral boundaries, some Christians and churches feel compelled to be all-inclusive. Apparently, the ancient church in Thyatira felt the same way. On the surface, the church's love, faith, service, and patience were admirable. But Christ, with fire-like eyes, recognized their deficiency. The one who searches the minds and hearts saw through their facades and into the heart of the problem, immorality. It only took one person, a self-proclaimed prophetess, according to verse 20, to corrupt the church. What does Christ have to say to a church that tolerates immorality? The threat of discipline. When the prophetess declined to repent, Christ warned of his judgment. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. Whether taken proverbially or literally, those words are forewarning. God is holy, and he will not tolerate rebellion indefinitely. As Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The threat of death. Revelation chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, NIV. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. This warning was not only directed at her, but also at those who commit adultery with her. Christ was prepared to judge anyone who was complicit in the woman's immorality. If they did not repent, they would face great tribulation. The Message to the Christians Revelation chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you, except to hold on to what you have until I come. Not every Thyatira believer was immoral. Some were well aware of God's holy standards and refused to deviate from them. The message to those who did not participate in the immorality cult was to stand firm. Hold fast what you have till I come verse 25. The message to the conquerors, Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 through 29. 
To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All who choose to be faithful until the end will be victorious. They would rule the nations alongside Christ during the millennium, and they would be raptured to heaven with him, the bright and morning star, before the tribulation. Sardis, the dead church. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Christ refers to himself in this message as he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, verse 1. The seven spirits represent the fullness of the Holy Spirit's ministry, chapter 5, verse 6, Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 2 through 5, which the Sardinian church had excluded from its affairs. The lights were turned on and people arrived, but the power of the Holy Spirit was lacking. Christ gave both praise and criticism to the other churches. There were no compliments in this church, only condemnation. I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. The place was full of what we today would call nominal Christians, Christians in name only. Christ gave five instructions for the church that is dead. Be sensitive to sin. We're not only to be awake, but to be watchful. From children's classes to the pulpit, teaching must be in accord with God's Word. Falling away from doctrine results in spiritual death. Be submissive to the control of the Holy Spirit. Only through the ministry of the Holy Spirit do we hear and receive God's words in a life-changing way. A church dies when the Holy Spirit departs, is grieved, or is quenched. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. When a person's spirit departs, his or her body dies, and the same is true for a church. Be subject to the authority of God's Word. Hold fast is usually associated with God's Word. If a church keeps the Word, it means that the Bible will be honored and faithfully taught. When a church abandons the Bible, the Holy Spirit loses His primary tool for transforming believers into the image of Christ. Be sorry and repent of sin. If you want to get back on track with God, the answer is always the same. Repent. Return to the truth of God's Word and flee from sin. Churches perish as a result of the sinfulness of their members. Churches, on the other hand, atone through the repentance of their members. Despite its flaws, Christ offered Sardis hope. The church could experience eternal life if it returned to obeying His commands. Philadelphia, the faithful church. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. 
I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven for my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Christ praised the Philadelphia church for four things. They had an open door, they had little strength, they had kept God's word, and they had not denied the Lord. If we want to be commended by Christ, we will go through open doors of ministry, rely on His strength, and be faithful to Him and His Word. What does this have to do with us today? If Christ is present and the church is committed to Him, a door of opportunity for ministry will open. Every church should pray for those doors to be recognized and opened. We rely on the church's head to provide the necessary strength to His body. In verse 8, Christ sums up three principles that apply to all churches. Open doors for ministry, relying on Christ's strength and keeping God's word, being obedient to God's word will result in new opportunities for ministry and reliance on God's power. Everything else will fall into place when the word of God is prioritized. Because the church belongs to Christ, we are to identify with him boldly, no matter the cost. We proclaim His name as the Bible does, as the only name through which we can be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on His throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Some of the harshest words recorded in the Bible were directed at the church in Laodicea by the Lord. He claimed that the church made him sick. It was compromising, conceited, and Christless in every way. The church of today should take note. Those words may apply to us as well. The Prescription for Spiritual Poverty the Lodicians were materially prosperous but spiritually bankrupt. They lacked spiritual riches which could only be obtained through Christ. When God bestows prosperity on Christians, He expects Christ-centered stewardship. A Christian with wealth bears the burden of discovering God's purpose in blessing him with that wealth and using it accordingly. The Prescription for Spiritual Nakedness In the Bible, nakedness is a metaphor for defeat and humiliation. The Laodiceans pretended to be clothed in righteousness, but they were actually naked and lacking in righteous acts. They were not on fire for the Lord, but rather lukewarm. As a result, Christ advised them to obtain white garments from Him so that their shame might be covered. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. The Prescription for Spiritual Compromise For the spiritually afflicted, there is only one piece of advice. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. However, Jesus summarizes his harsh words, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Good parents discipline their children, but have you ever witnessed a parent abandon a child? We can be thankful that God does not act in this manner. He loves us too much to abandon us as we are, and he longs for us to return to him when we need to. The Prescription for Their Christlessness Christ does not storm into unwelcome churches. Instead, he waits for an invitation. Behold, I will stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. 
There were apparently even fewer believers in Laodicea than in Sardis. His invitation extends to anyone who hears his voice. Laodicea, from a prophetic standpoint, represents the church in the end times. It's heartbreaking to think of Christ standing outside his own church, but we must ask ourselves if this is a reflection of ourselves. Is the Lord being pushed out of our gatherings? Is his word being tainted in our pulpits? Are we too preoccupied with our plans and programs to notice that we have crowded him out? If Christ is knocking on your heart's door or your church's door, don't be reluctant. Invite him in.